So hello everyone, welcome to the Virginia Tech Mechanical Engineering webinar today. I'm really happy to have Dr. Laura Blumenshine. Laura is an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at Purdue University. She received her master's degree in mechanical engineering from Rice in 2016, which is where we met. Uh, and she got her PhD in mechanical engineering from Stanford in 2019. Laura is a recipient of the NSF GRFP, uh, and her work has been featured uh, very broadly, including the Wall Street Journal, Popular Science, Wired, and CBS's Innovation Nation. So please join me in welcoming Laura to Virginia Tech. We are very excited to hear uh, you talk and learn more about your work. Great, thank you, Dylan, uh, both for the invitation and for that uh, very kind introduction. I will go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and I assume that uh, everyone can see that. So hopefully, um, my uh, internet holds out in terms of uh, showing some of the cool videos I've got today, um, mostly because uh, we're on fall break here. So I assume most of the students are not on campus. I should have the internet all to myself. Um, but uh, as uh, uh, Dylan said, I am a professor uh, at Purdue University. I joined uh, uh, about a year ago now. Uh, and so I've been doing some exciting work. But uh, what I will be showing here is a mix of uh, what I have done um, uh, previously, uh, both in uh, my PhD work as well as some other projects uh, outside of um, Stanford that I worked on, uh, as well as some initial work that I've done in the past year here at Purdue. So the title of my talk, without further ado, uh, is Designing Soft Robots Through Geometric Modeling. Um, and so this is uh, going to be kind of an explainer with uh, three examples of one method that I like to go about for designing soft robots, which is particularly different from how we think about traditional robotics. Um, uh, so let's get into it. So uh, as Dylan was telling me, uh, many of you may, may be in his uh, introduction to robotics class. Um, so this sort of scene uh, of robots uh, constructing things, these rigid manipulators with joints uh, may be familiar to what uh, you are learning or, you know, otherwise um, have seen in research or robotics. Uh, and this is sort of the uh, starting location when we talk about robotics, right? We're talking about uh, rigid manipulators that do these very repeatable motions over and over and over again. Um, but the one thing you won't see here uh, is humans. And you also see that this is in a very controlled uh, environment. In fact, this uh, this is kind of a, a GIF on a loop. But if you actually were watching these robots, they would be repeatedly doing these things over and over and over again. And so this is really where robots have currently found their uh, niche uh, in these highly controlled uh, manufacturing settings. Uh, however, when we look at popular culture, um, often see depictions of robots out in the real world. And so the question is, why is that not currently achievable? Why is that a thing that we don't currently see uh, today? Um, and so one way to think about this is that the robots that we see uh, in popular culture are actually often taking a different approach to interacting with the world, and it's a more bio-inspired approach. And so this is also the approach that we talk about in the field of soft robotics. Um, so in soft robotics, we're talking about, uh, let me get a pointer option up here, laser pointer. Uh, we are talking about um, robots that imitate animals like this fish robot here. We're talking about robots that have multimodal gates. Maybe they can crawl, but they can also walk. Uh, we're talking about things that stretch, that deform, uh, and that extend into their environments. Um, and how we go about understanding and designing these robots uh, at this point in time uh, is very different from how we think about traditional uh, robot manipulators, where we are concerned primarily with, uh, with uh, joints uh, and rigid links between those joints. Uh, however, we're kind of not necessarily left in the dark. Uh, when it comes to modeling and designing these things. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, one method that I use to go about designing soft robots. Um, so the principle here, uh, if I can get the next slide to advance, 
um, is to design through geometric constraints, similar to how we think about uh, uh, rigid robotic manipulators, um, and build simplified kinematic models out of these constraints. But these geometric constraints are not uh, going to be kind of one size fits all. They're going to be developed based off of the interactions that we see uh, between the soft robot uh, and the world or the soft uh, actuators that we're using. So the reason why this works is there's a high link between what is called the morphology or the, um, the form of the robot uh, and the actual resulting behavior of the soft robot. Uh, modeling in this way can be a useful design tool, but only if the models are simple enough to use for design. Um, so geometric constraints then can create simple building blocks that we can use to build up and create more complex behaviors. And this combination of simplified modeling and geometric constraints yields design principles for uh, creating complex and useful kinematics from compliant systems. Um, so if that doesn't make a lot of sense uh, yet, uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into some examples of what I'm talking about, which should hopefully uh, clear up, uh, uh, once we reach the end of the talk, should hopefully clear up what I mean by these geometric constraints and simplified kinematic models. Um, so the three examples I'm going to go through uh, are one uh, where we used growing robots uh, and obstacle interactions to decrease uncertainty during navigation of cluttered environments. I'm going to be talking about geometric models uh, of general actuation for soft continuum robots. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about a slightly different project, um, which involved the design of soft delta mechanisms and modeling how they uh, apply forces and move. Uh, in their workspace. Um, so we'll start uh, with this first one here, uh, optical interaction to decrease uncertainty. Uh, so the introduction here, uh, we'll start with introducing this soft growing robot. Uh, so this robot, let's see if we can get the video to play. Having a little bit of difficulty with my videos. Like it's just stalling out. Um, so uh, the robot here uh, moves by extending uh, into its environment. Um, it uh, unfurls material such that the body of the robot uh, remains stationary, uh, but the tip moves forward. Um, Let's see, it appears my computer has completely locked up. Uh, Dylan, would you be able to chime in just so I can make sure that I have, I still have you guys on WebEx yeah, or on Zoom? Here. Okay, here. let me see if I can. Uh, would you like to like maybe restart your PowerPoint? Yeah, I think I'm gonna try to restart my PowerPoint, but I've uh, got to find my way over to the... Um, Give me just one second. No problem. This is the uh, the uh, risky run with sharing a uh, high high uh, high density videos over PowerPoint. Uh, is sometimes it'll lock up your computer. Yeah, you um, too high quality. <laughs> uh, but we should get it up in just a second. While you're doing that, let me share with the students um, a link to your lab. Um, ah, yes, that would be great. This might help. Um, let me see. Uh, okay, I've got it back up. Let me see if I can get back into where I was at. Uh, okay. Um, okay, there we go. The video is playing again, and I hopefully people can see that now. Uh, as I was saying, so the soft-growing robots uh, 
move by extending into their environments. Uh, you can see the sh stripes here, uh, assuming this video is coming across fairly clear, uh, are not moving, but the tip is extending. Um, so this has a lot of interesting results uh, when we talk about how uh, the quote unquote robot here actually moves. Um, so for example, it uh, displays basically no resistance to this very sticky flypaper. Um, we can move through very, very small gaps. Um, we can uh, move past nails uh, without being impeded. Um, and then even environments that you would typically think of as impossible to traverse, um, uh, like sand, um, can be traversed by just a little added fluidization uh, of the system here. So the most interesting behavior though for this section um, is this video down here in the corner where this robot uh, inside of this constrained tube uh, grows and bumps into its environment uh, and moves uh, through it with very little uh, steering actively. So this is a mostly passive system that's just growing in order to navigate this tube. So the question here is how do we actually harness these environmental interactions to improve navigation? So I've promised that this is going to be geometry based. So let's get to what the geometry here is. And the geometric approach here is we are going to look at these uh, interaction and try to develop a very simple geometric kinematic model of what is going on. And so we start with the simplest behavior we can think of, which is a robot uh, growing, a tube growing with no steering uh, into a flat wall. And we can see that it, the tip of the robot grows tangent to the obstacle and moves along it. And we get a body pivot uh, at the this constrained point previously back here. Um, so one way to put this is that the environment is passively guiding the robot. Um, but another way to put this is just this very simple model, which is um, if you hit at an angle greater than, uh, greater than 90 degrees uh, in one direction, you will slide in that direction uh, and vice versa. Uh, so this is a very, very simple kinematic model, uh, but it actually ends up being very, very powerful for even more than just this uh, simple flat wall, since we can apply this to any tangent uh, surface that we find. Uh, and so based off of this, we can build a uh, navigation model uh, that takes into account the current robot state, and at every point allows us to just add kind of the next length of robot that we expect to grow. Um, we have pivot points where the robot can potentially turn based either off of obstacle context or based off of uh, turns that we program into the robot. Um, and then as we encounter new obstacles, uh, we add obstacle contacts and move along those obstacles. Um, this is the obligatory math slide for this section of the talk, uh, but the basic idea here uh, is again, just a simplified kinematic model uh, in math to describe that uh, behavior we were talking about before, uh, which says if you are moving without uh, running into an obstacle, you continue moving in the direction that you're pointed based off of your previous uh, pivot points. Uh, and if you are not uh, moving freely, if you're in contact with an obstacle, you just find the tangent vector along that obstacle and that determines the direction you move. Uh, and again, you can see this process of adding these new pivot points and tip points uh, as we move along. So what does this look like in uh, actual uh, behavior? Uh, well, we can use it to predict the location that a robot is gonna grow uh, in this sort of method here. Um, and so you can see that just slightly changing the angle that we are uh, launching this robot at, uh, this one has no turns in it, um, but slightly changing this angle uh, in this cluttered environment yields very different behaviors. Um, this is almost uh, what you might describe as kind of a chaotic system behavior um, because we uh, quickly change from going to one of these exits to going to another based off of just which side of this obstacle we hit on. Um, however, it's very predictable and we are able easily just with the simplified model to determine where we expect to end up. Uh, so 
adding in steering then, I, I mentioned this already, but we can add in turns ourselves to create pivot points, not just relying on the environment. Um, and we do this by uniformly shortening one side. So we pinch a little bit of material uh, that'll create a bend. Um, and as we grow, that bend shows up in a desired location, uh, wherever we put it at. Uh, and it does not move again uh, because of how the growth works. Um, so now we get to the actual use of this model. Um, I said that these models would be used for design. And so this is how we're going to use this model in design. Uh, we understand how uh, interacting with obstacles works. Um, and so now we're going to use that uh, obstacle contact model to intelligently plan where to send our robots in order to get them to go to our desired locations. So the idea to understand here uh, is that we're going to have some nominal design. Uh, then we're going to assume that there's some amount of manufacturing error because that's almost certainly always true. Um, and so that means that our built design will not quite match up with our nominal design. Um, however, uh, if we intelligently plan these obstacle contacts, this error shouldn't affect us uh, as much as you would expect uh, without obstacle contacts. Um, so our planning objective here is to find the nominal design with the highest expectation of reaching the desired target given the obstacle interactions. Um, so uh, just getting on to the kind of meat of this then, uh, we'll see this in work. Uh, we have a target uh, marked by this blue ring. Uh, and the path that you just saw was the planned one uh, based off of running into these obstacles. Um, and so you can see that the instead of avoiding obstacles, like you might see in um, a lot of traditional navigation robots, um, here we are intentionally running into these obstacles um, to sort of localize where we are at in space. Um, and despite the robot not taking exactly the path that we uh, expect based off of this orange path, um, we are still able to pretty accurately without any closed loop control, this is all open loop, um, get to our desired location. Uh, and running this in simulation uh, with some simulated errors instead of just actual human errors that uh, happened in our uh, demonstration there. Um, we can see that uh, this isn't just a coincidence. In fact, that intentionally running into obstacles is leading to us getting less uh, overall spread in our final, uh, final deployment. Um, and avoiding some of those bifurcations uh, in the potential path uh, that we had seen uh, in that earlier video. Um, and so this is a, a really promising result um, in terms of understanding how uh, we want to navigate these environments. Um, uh, and in the future, we hope to use uh, this sort of uh, understanding of obstacle contacts to flip the script uh, so to say, on this on this demonstration here, uh, where instead of using known obstacles uh, in order to determine a planned path, uh, actually using these behaviors uh, to uh, measure and model uh, where obstacles are in a space uh, as we encounter them. Uh, so with that, I'll move on to the second example uh, we showed here. Uh, and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, uh, and we can go back uh, and talk about all of these different sections. Uh, but so in this first uh, example, we showed a, a very simple kinematic model and how we can then use that to design uh, open loop paths uh, for our robot to traverse. Um, here we're also going to talk about uh, kinematic models, uh, but for a slightly different purpose, the purpose of matching desired shapes uh, of this soft robot tube. Um, so uh, there's a question here that we'll start with, which is the basis for this model. Uh, how do we achieve a desired shape of a growing robot uh, through active actuation? Um, so one part of that answer is the physical actuator that we're going to use. Um, but uh, the other part of this is how do we actually get the shape that we want? So maybe we want to wrap around a 
object out in space in order to grasp it, or maybe we want to do some sort of complex behavior like tying ourselves in a knot. Uh, and so the actuation that we're working with here uh, is of the form that allows us to sort of shorten one side, uh, like I mentioned in the previous section, uh, but here we're doing it actively. So we are pulling on this string here, uh, which is bringing these little connectors together um, and is resulting in a curved path of our robot. Uh, we can also do this with pneumatic actuators, uh, which we've done previously. These pneumatic actuators act much like those tendons do, uh, but instead of kind of pulling sections together, uh, they just shorten along the entire length, uh, also resulting in a curve for our robot here. Um, in action, uh, we can see these uh, these pneumatic muscles in action um, in this, this video where we are steering a growing robot around using a joystick. Um, and in this case, uh, we are we have just put the uh, pneumatic actuators uh, along the length of the robot, so we can only really get these kind of constant smooth curves in any direction. Um, so the question here then is, how do we go about creating more complex shapes like we described at the top there? Um, well, one answer is let's just take those tendons, uh, those actuators, which were uh, aligned with the, you know, straight along the body of the robot here, uh, and let's give them an angle. Um, so we're just gonna put them at an angle instead. Um, and as we do that, uh, we instantly get more interesting shapes. Uh, and these shapes are going to be uh, perfect helices uh, designed as a sort of spiral in 3D. Um, we can see that both with a pneumatic actuator here, the actuator is the yellow one, and you can see as it pressurizes, we get that helix shape. Um, and with uh, tendon actuators, uh, as we pull uh, the actuator here, we can achieve a uh, helical shape uh, and we can also grow that shape um, to extend uh, how far that helice goes. Um, so then uh, again, let's get back to the geometric part of this talk. Uh, we want to understand uh, the kinematics associated with these actuators. Um, and so let's talk about the geometry that relates the path of the actuator um, to the final shape of the robot. Um, so this path of the actuator, we're gonna describe with a few different terms. Uh, we describe the diameter of the tube, the angle, as we said uh, previously of the actuator. Uh, and then we're also gonna define a parameter that, that sort of tells us how uh, much has the uh, actuator been activated where one means unactuated um, and then less than one is how we define uh, an actuated shape. Uh, and then the shape itself is going to be defined as a helix uh, with an outer and inner radius uh, and then a pitch uh, B, uh, which tells us how high the spiral gets uh, after one revolution. Um, so uh, again, some uh, uh, obligatory math here. Uh, we can relate the inner and outer paths of these helix based off of their lengths uh, to get one equation uh, that tells us sort of one parameter, geometric parameter of this situation. Uh, we can then also look at the cross sections of the tube to get two more ge geometric parameters. Uh, one tells us that uh, is a pretty simple one that just tells us that the outer radius and the inner radius uh, should have a difference between them equal to the diameter of the tube. Um, the other one is a little more complex, uh, but is based off of the tangent vectors from this inner and outer path. Uh, and these vectors always stay with this angle uh, of two theta between them uh, as they are actuated. And so we can take the dot product between these two, um, yielding this third equation. Um, so uh, these are the equations. Uh, it is uh, not sort of vital to understand uh, where these come from, but what is important to know here is that they are closed form. Uh, so meaning that we have three equations and three unknowns on each side, um, and we can exactly go from shape to actuator and actuator shape back and forth uh, when we're talking about 
uh, helical uh, robots and helical tendons. Okay, uh, and the actual, yes, the actual uh, parameter that we're changing as we actuate again is this lambda. Um, the other two are set in our design. Uh, so we can get a wide range of helices, um, and these helices match well uh, with what is predicted by our model. Um, so, for example, let's just take this five degree segment here, uh, and we can measure the paths from the inner and outer, uh, and we can see how well they match with our predicted models. Uh, however, I said we were going to get general shapes. Uh, we've kind of gotten somewhere from constant curvature to helix, um, and then we moved from uh, uh, we moved to the helix shapes. Um, but now we need to move beyond that, how we can get beyond just these helical shapes. Um, so the simple answer here is, well, let's just stack helices. Uh, so what if we take uh, a lambda of 0.5, a diameter of 0.5, and we're going to just change that angle that we do on the tube of the actuator uh, as we go. Uh, and so we can see that we get instantly something a little more interesting. Uh, it's still recognizably this sort of spiral, uh, but we have changed the behavior in the center. Okay, so let's take this to the extreme then. Let's make every point its own little helix, uh, and we're going to break this up into a bunch of different segments uh, with length delta L. Um, and each one of those, we're going to assign a theta, a lambda, um, uh, and as far as our kind of as tight as our uh, resolution can allow us, let's make a general shape of this actuator uh, out of little helical shapes along the length. Uh, so again, sort of the obligatory math behind it. Uh, here is a, a nice scary slide that has just a lot of math on it. Uh, but in actuality, um, this is just the uh, transformation that we add to connect those helical segments together. Um, it's the transformation matrix that tells us how those segments connect together, both in the rotation uh, and the positional change. Um, and we define a few terms uh, for the purposes of simplifying the math up here. Um, this is the transformation along the center line. So we have to define the change in length along the center line. Um, and we define this L, uh, which is the sort of unit length of each helix uh, as it goes. Okay, but really what we care about is whether this works. Um, so we've got a very simple model, uh, relatively, that's based just off of these helices. Um, and so we want to take it, uh, take a shape of a, a, an actuator um, and see if we can actually predict out the shape that results. So here's the prediction based off of all of those earlier equations. Um, and if we actually build this shape, um, using this actuator design, uh, we can see that there's a good correspondence between our predicted shape and our built shape. Um, and again, if we measure this uh, using a magnetic tracker to measure the inside path here, uh, we get a very um, small RMSE of 0.45 uh, centimeters given the size of uh, this, this shape here. Um, we can also validate it for active shapes. Uh, so here we route in a kind of sinusoidal wave this pneumatic actuator on the tube here. Um, and we can see, again, this good matching between our model uh, and our measured shapes um, uh, as we do this active actuation. Uh, but I said we were going to use this for design tools, so let's uh, actually do that. Um, and our design goal, as we stated at the top of this section, was to design uh, actuators that could yield the shapes we were interested in. So uh, we developed a shape matching algorithm that essentially allowed us to find those actuator parameters, uh, theta and lambda. Uh, we had to just choose a diameter based off of the actual shape of the robot, but we were free to fit lambda and theta um, for each segment of this shape. Um, and we kind of look at the next n segments to make sure that this doesn't yield us uh, kind of going off in the wrong direction. Um, 
And then we save uh, each fit segment uh, and repeat along the total length of the shape. Um, so let's look at some results then. Uh, if we take nice uh, smooth curvatures uh, in 3D, um, we can see that this match between our uh, here, our blue shape and our red shape, um, uh, where our red shape is our uh, modeled uh, match, our predicted match based off of our actuator fitting, and blue is the shape we're trying to hit. Um, uh, we can see that these match well. Uh, the only interesting bit here is we do have some uh, kind of high frequency noise based off of how we're fitting this uh, in our theta parameter here. Um, when we sort of change direction uh, at one point in here. Um, so this is a, an area of future work that we're working on right now to see how we can get smoother fits for the actuators. Um, we can also do this for two dimensional curves. So here's an S curve. Uh, and we would expect that this is going to want us to kind of curve in one direction and then flip the actuator to the other side to curve in the other direction. Uh, and this method of fitting uh, does exact result in that, uh, if you can see by the actuator path here, uh, we start at zero and then flip around to the other side of the tube. Um, and our lambda changes. Uh, again, we get that high frequency theta. Um, and then finally, we can try to match non smooth shapes as well. Uh, here is just a set of points uh, in space, and we're trying to hit those points. Uh, we can see that this results in a kind of much more uh, 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 jumpy design uh, as it's trying to hit those sharp corners, um, but uh, we still are able to yield an actuator design um, that theoretically should match our target shape. Uh, I say in theory, so you know we want to go out and actually test this, and we did that for uh, one of these shapes, this knot shape. Um, Using the same method, uh, we generated this actuator path where the little red uh, parts here are the uh, amount that we're going to pinch at each point or remove with our actuation. Um, and if we do that, we can see that we do in fact get a shape that yields this knot tying uh, shape. Um, and again, measuring it, uh, we get a very low error relative to our desired shape. Um, here, we're not accounting for anything like gravity or anything like that. So getting an RMSE of uh, six millimeters is, is great in this case. Um, if we build this uh, physically, uh, we can see some interesting behaviors uh, based off of the actual uh, fact that this is a growing robot. Uh, so on the bottom here, you can see us trying to essentially use this as a continuum arm. Uh, and curl it up into this knot shape, uh, and it does not achieve the knot since it would have to cross through itself. Um, but since we are doing this on a growing robot, uh, we are in fact able to tie it in a knot if we actuate while we are growing, uh, and it stays in that knot even after we uh, let go of the actuation. Um, okay. So uh, with that, I will move on to the final example, uh, which will be a slightly different one here. So we've been talking about growing robots for a little while. Let's talk about uh, a slightly different actuator in this uh, 3D printed uh, soft delta mechanism. Uh, so here, uh, like I said, we're gonna be looking at a slightly different actuator. The two uh, portions of this uh, that are important to know uh, is that these are all 3D printed actuators. We have a few different examples here. Um, these ones up top uh, that I'll be talking about first were uh, multi-material polyjet printing. Um, and then uh, an actuator I'll be talking about later on in some of our more recent work, we used uh, instead an SLA printing uh, using the form labs. Uh, bellows actuators are an interesting type of soft actuator uh, in that they change length through bending uh, and stretching the wall material, though primarily through bending. Um, and depending on how you build uh, the shape of the bellows, uh, you can get very large length changes. So here with this one uh, on top, we're getting a 340% length change. Um, it's not displayed, we don't have the actuated shape, but uh, we can get between the pressurized and the unpressurized shape, we can get 340% length change. Uh, the actual method that this actuation is using, we have the soft wall here uh, or here, uh, and then we are putting air into it, uh, which is pushing against these rigid caps on the end, 
uh, causing the bellow to extend uh, or otherwise apply force uh, at the end uh, to its environment. Uh, so let's see one in action. Uh, if we pressurize the actuator, we can see that it extends. Uh, and then when we release pressure and pull vacuum instead, it compresses. Um, so this is getting us that 340% length change I talked about. Um, why are we using these actuators uh, and bellows actuators specifically? Well, they have one uh, very nice uh, feature, uh, which relates again back to the topic of this talk, uh, which is that they have these nice linear models, uh, which are based primarily on their geometry. Um, so if we relate their pressure to their force or their pressure to their actuator length, um, we get these linear relationships uh, based either off of the surface area that pressure is pushing against um, or based off of this length change uh, through a essentially modeling this as a linear stiffness. Um, now the exciting thing about this is since they are soft actuators, uh, we can actually kind of put them in any sort of configuration we want uh, and attach them to over constrain a point. Uh, but due to their compliance, uh, they're still able to move about and actuate uh, collectively this center point. Um, so uh, thinking about these actuators and how we want to combine uh, their outputs to get that resulting behavior, we can think about deriving a Jacobian uh, for this system. Uh, just meaning that we are relating here the input uh, through the pressure uh, to each of the actuators to the final output force uh, at this center point. Um, since each of the actuators uh, is based off of pressure, uh, we can think of each of them as acting on a certain area uh, in a certain direction. Um, and so we just take the sum of all of those uh, directions and pressure forces in order to get the resulting force at the center. Um, for this situation, uh, we've got uh, equally spaced actuators, uh, three of them in here, but we'll see later on some examples where we have more than three. Um, and we just talk about uh, the initial angle that they're at and the number to determine uh, what direction we end up uh, putting those U vectors in. Um, so uh, if we constrain the center point and look at the forces uh, as we pressurize uh, these actuators, um, we can see that we get this sort of interesting triangular profile in the forces. Um, here, this is the pressure sum. Um, so how much total pressure we're putting into all of the actuators combined. Um, and we can see that we get sort of the most bang for our buck uh, when we're going along the direction of one of the actuators, um, but we're able to achieve kind of intermediary directions by pressurizing more than one actuator. Um, this area here is what we're actually fitting to understand how well this model fits with our Jacobian, um, as well as this initial offset angle. Um, so here we get a fit of uh, area of 54 uh, millimeters squared and an offset angle of 56 degrees. Uh, and we get a very high R squared value indicating that these sort of linear combination models well predict what is going on in this system. Uh, this doesn't just work for that single actuator. Uh, we can, uh, that single actuator combination, uh, we can scale up the actuators uh, up to, you know, 250% here. Uh, look at their resulting uh, predicted areas and max forces. Uh, and we see that we get some scaling based off of area. So we are in fact getting the behavior we expect out of these bellows actuators. Um, and as I hinted at, we don't have to just talk about three actuators. We can over constrain our system or over actuate our system even more. Um, excuse me, by putting in uh, four or even six uh, actuators. Uh, and this does change our overall force profile here uh, based off of the pressure sum. Um, and adding in more actuators uh, lets us get this sort of smoother force profile throughout our environment. Um, however, we've just been talking about forces so far. Uh, what if we want to model both the force and the position together? Uh, well, this is going to require us to talk about the shear force uh, of the actuator as it's moving through the space. 
So we did a separate set of tests on a slightly different actuator, um, looking at uh, putting them into a constrained position uh, and then measuring the amount of force uh, and uh, in both shear and axial directions, uh, as well as torque that they applied on this force torque sensor um, as they are pressurized. Uh, so uh, the results here without uh, kind of uh, much uh, further ado uh, look like this. Uh, again, we get those linear behaviors out that we saw previously uh, with that other single actuator um, for the axial forces. Uh, but interestingly for the shear forces, uh, we get this sort of changing linear behavior, changing slope uh, as we change the angle. Uh, so the variation of axial and shear forces um, is both a function of the pressure as well as the deformation. Um, however, we can look at these, uh, these uh, behaviors uh, in terms of the geometry of the actuator. Um, so here we're going to look at two separate uh, kind of occurrences. Uh, one is looking at uh, here in A and B, uh, we are looking at how the inner versus outer surface area changes uh, to understand how the pressure affects uh, the shear force. Um, and then in C and D, we are modeling our combined behavior as this, uh, due to deformation, uh, as a linear spring plus a torsional spring. Um, so this linear spring uh, is going to oppose the direction of extension uh, in in that direction of theta that we've kind of sheared it to. Um, and the, the torsional spring is going to apply a force per perpendicular to that uh, direction theta um, based off of the amount of angle that we have sheared through. Uh, so up top, we have the combined models uh, where we have uh, the axial force Fz uh, is equal to the pressure times the area uh, minus this combined uh, linear and torsional spring. Uh, and then the shear force uh, is this pressure times this area that increases with the shear, uh, again, multiplied by that, um, uh, that linear and torsional spring. Um, for the purposes of kind of simplifying this model, we take a small angle approximation uh, yielding these two equations down here. Um, uh, you can see that Fy is entirely dependent on theta. Um, so if we uh, set theta equal to zero, the shear force disappears, uh, which makes sense in this case. Um, so again, let's look at how this actually plays out. Um, so we want to go back to that three actuator system. Uh, we've fit all of these parameters using data. Um, and we want to see how well we can predict out the final position uh, based only on the pressures. Um, and so here we see uh, the result. Uh, these orange dots are this model up here with shear and axial forces. Um, and then the green dots here are if we only consider the, um, that kind of initial pressurized spring model that we had talked about uh, for the forces uh, for that first section of this uh, experiment. Um, we can see that we get very, very kind of close uh, and um, uh, relationship between the actual measured position uh, and this modeled position. Um, and we can see that the, the errors don't have any relationship uh, with how far out uh, we um, are extending into our workspace, uh, unlike this spring model, which is um, typically uh, overestimating how far out um, we can push our actuator. Um, so the average error for our com combined model uh, was 3.5%, uh, which is very good uh, for this system, for a soft system. Um, so uh, those are the three examples I have here of applying geometric constraints to simplify uh, kinematic models. Um, and we showed very different, like I said, kinematic models um, and geometric constraints for each of these systems. Um, so I'll just end on a few uh, conclusions, uh, kind of bringing back those topics we talked about at the start. Um, so like I said at the start, uh, the goal here was to develop these building blocks for design. Um, and we saw in each of these cases that we were able to develop kind of this simple behavior that we could then uh, either apply in series or in parallel 
uh, in order to get a, a more complex behavior out. Um, and so this modeling approach involves identifying those building blocks, uh, observing heuristics, uh, decomposing the complex designs, uh, and then targeted design uh, through uh, intentionally finding you know, soft actuators that have these nice geometric models. Um, the created models uh, predict the behavior well enough to design more complex interactions um, or to be sort of a uh, initial model that we can then use for feed forward uh, control uh, in a uh, more complex system. Um, and the overall accuracy here is limited only by the assumptions and simplifications we're making uh, with the geometric constraints. So that's important to keep in mind uh, based off of what uh, limitations and assumptions you make. Um, so my main goal in the future here with the sort of methods um, is uh, to further expand this sort of uh, approach to soft robot design. Um, leading to more rapid prototyping and understanding of uh, new soft robotic functions, uh, and especially creating very complex actuation uh, that is capable um, with these compliant actuators. Uh, so real briefly, before we get to the questions, I got to uh, thank some of my collaborators here. Um, so like I said, this is uh, work that comes from a wide uh, range of the different uh, groups I have been a part of. Uh, so I want to thank uh, some of my colleagues back at Stanford, some of my colleagues who were at Stanford but are now at uh, Notre Dame and Facebook Reality Labs, uh, as well as colleagues that I worked with um, uh, outside of Stanford, um, Elliot Hawks at UCSB, uh, Caleb Rucker at uh, uh, University of Tennessee, um, Ron Alterovitz at UNC, uh, and Yeet uh, Menguk at Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, as well as all of the sponsors on this project, the many, uh, many different sponsors on these various projects. Um, so with that, I'll leave you with some of these cool videos, uh, assuming this doesn't freeze up my computer again, uh, and I will take any questions uh, that you have. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Blumenstein, for that great talk. It looks like we have some questions in the chat. Would you like me to read them? Um, uh, I can see them, so I can uh, I can just uh, I can go ahead and, and answer them. Um, uh, so the first one is about uh, the manufacturing of robots, um, uh, and is about how it is difficult to do it, uh, perhaps manually, to achieve the exact positional RMSE figures presented. Um, so uh, this is a a, a great question. Um, so uh, um, all of this was done by hand. Uh, uh, for anyone who is experienced in, uh, in university research or grad school research, uh, sometimes grad school time or grad student time, excuse me, uh, is the most valuable resource you have uh, for manufacturing things like this. Um, so those RMSEs uh, are um, what is kind of achievable by hand. Um, uh, the reason we suspect that we're able to get so good matching uh, even with uh, kind of this by hand design uh, is because sort of errors smooth out uh, on the whole um, and you tend to average out errors which uh, yields to them sort of canceling. Um, however, this is an area that we're actively sort of exploring and hoping to uh, get some of those custom manufacturing tools where we can do more precise and measure the um, the true limits of this model uh, when we're not accounting for human error. Um, and then there's one more in the, uh, I see someone's hand is up, but uh, there's one more in the chat, um, uh, which is about what constitutes soft and soft robotics. Um, yeah, this is also a great question, uh, which everyone in soft robotics will have a different answer to. Um, so, uh, Generally, uh, my philosophy on it is that uh, soft robotics is um, sort of the general field that deals with uh, allowing compliance uh, into your system. So this can be compliance uh, in a specific direction. Uh, it can be compliance based off of control. Um, generally, it is compliance based off of the actual materials. Um, so uh, the 
the material properties have a big effect on these behaviors. Um, but uh, in the examples I kind of shown here, uh, we can identify these behaviors that are uh, maybe not independent of material property, but um, can be explained without needing to uh, go to the material properties and the compliance directly of the system. Yeah. Um, I see that uh, Leela uh, has a yeah. question if you want to. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. So uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, so in the first example, you mentioned that an uh, open loop controller is used for path planning. Could you please share what type of controller it is? Like what type of path planning algorithm is used? Sure, yes. Um, so the actual path planning algorithm we used there uh, was based off of um, essentially choosing waypoints um, at the surface of obstacles uh, or within the, um, the Voronoi uh, uh, sort of cells in between these obstacle corners. Um, so we were doing a pretty simple uh, uh, sort of uh, map search uh, based off of all the potential paths between those points. Um, and we just found the ones that uh, limited our um, uh, limited our error, our final error, considering the obstacle contact. Um, so that was the sort of actual path planning algorithm behind the scenes. Uh, and what I meant by open loop is the only sort of control we get is at the point of manufacturing. Uh, past that, uh, we have no uh, closed loop control within the system. Uh, thanks for the question. That was, uh, was a very good question. Thanks. Um, so you meant Voronoi yes. roadmap planning. Yes, uh, Voronoi, uh, well, yeah. So so Voronoi roadmap planning is essentially what we did. Um, I don't know if it strictly matches with sort of the literature on that, uh, but that was that's my best approximation of saying what we did. We didn't, uh, we didn't do anything kind of more complicated like a sa sampling-based planning um, okay. since we wanted to get those exact contacts with the obstacles. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a, another question in the chat uh, from Britton uh, asking, have you explored adding a functional device such as a sensor, microphone, or gripper to the growing tip of the robot? Uh, this is a great question. Yes, we have done some of this and we're hoping to do more soon. Um, so uh, adding things to the end of a kind of robot like this where the end is constantly changing uh, is a little difficult to do. You have to be a little clever about how you add those sensors uh, or payloads in. Um, but we have designed some cap designs uh, uh, that allow you to keep uh, sensors or grippers at the end of the robot, um, uh, as well as allowing you to more easily retract the robot. So none of the things that I showed here, uh, or except for that first video, uh, showed us retracting the robot, but that's actually a pretty difficult problem um, when you're thinking about this sort of compliant tube uh, that is only held up by the pressure within it. Um, uh, so uh, if you are interested more in this, uh, I will put a, a quick link in the chat, um, but uh, there is um, uh, a website that we have a lot of the growing robot stuff on vinerobots.org, um, uh, which uh, describes some of that other work that we've done. Um, I see another hand up from uh, Sohil. Uh, hopefully I'm saying your name right. Uh, yes, that ahead. was perfect. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you so much for this interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions. First question is about your second project. Um, you mentioned some oscillations about for the theta parameter that you observed during the simulations. And I was wondering if you measured these oscillations in the experiment as well. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should be I should be more uh, careful about my uh, my wording there. Uh, oscillations meaning um, like changes in our oscillations in our um, uh, our uh, optimization, like in the actual variable. It wasn't dynamic behavior within the robot itself, uh, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. So I was wondering if if you measured theta value during the experiment as well, and you observed the same behavior. 
Yeah, so uh, in the experiments, the, the actual ones that we produced, we tried to make shapes where that theta value kind of smoothly changed uh, because those are easier to manufacture by hand. Um, uh, and this comes back to trying to, uh, in the future, find some optimization algorithms that get rid of that kind of oscillation uh, in the theta parameter. Um, to explain what that oscillation in the theta parameter actually means is that when you go trying to build this actuator, uh, you are essentially forced to kind of zigzag it back and forth on the robot, uh, which is just hard to manufacture. Um, right. Like I said, yeah. Okay, thank you. And my last question is, it's kind of higher level question. Um, sure. You showed examples of controlling motions in soft robots and also force. So how, yes. how does these things balance out each other in real life applications for soft robots. Um, can we produce soft robots that can create our desired motions as well as our des the desired force generations? For example, you showed the, the knot shape. Um, that was perfect, not only in the simulation, but also in the experiment. But uh, if these soft robots contact the actual object, can they still uh, produce the same, same motion? And yes. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and this kind is, of, uh, no, go ahead. The, the higher level question would be, do, can we make a soft robotic manipulator just using one type of actuator based on your experience? Or do we need to combine different types together? And yeah. that's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. B both great questions. Um, so uh, to the question of, you know, this sort of can we enforce movements and forces? Um, there is work that looks at that. Um, not, I don't have any work specifically from, from my side, um, but this is, does come up kind of against a, a philosophical divide maybe between how we think about traditional robots and soft robots, um, where one of the benefits of soft robotics potentially uh, is its ability to deform when it hits um, or comes into contact with an object. Um, and so more the way we try to think about soft robots is um, designing that response uh, such that um, maybe we don't get our enforced force or position, uh, but we are designing how that varies between force and position as it's contacting the environment. Um, so you can think about something like a soft leg coming down and touching uh, a surface um, and wanting it to, you know, uh, not come down as far and not apply as much force if it comes to a step. Uh, that is unexpectedly higher than it um, it had modeled for. Um, and then on the other um, the other side of things, the what types of soft actuators do we need? Um, this is also a, an open area of discussion. Uh, I think that there will be a lot of uh, interesting work in the next sort of five years on um, condensing all of these various different types of soft actuators to figure out what are the best ones for different tasks? Um, so I think it's going to be a very application specific answer to that question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I, I don't know if we're out of time then, but uh, I'm sure Dylan will tell me. Um, yeah, we've, we've made it through the hour um, and I don't see any more uh, questions from the chat. Um, if anyone does have any questions, I'm sure that they could reach uh, Dr. Blumenshine through email um, or her, or her yep. or collaborators um, as well. Yep. Yep, I, I would be happy to answer any questions uh, by email if you have any after this talk uh, as well. Yep. Okay, then great. So thank you once again, uh, Dr. Blumenshine. That was a fantastic talk. It was really interesting to learn um, new things. I always have dealt with uh, rigid robots, so it's always fun for me to see uh, soft robots in action doing things that I would never be able to do with my rigid robot arms.